Hi and welcome. My name is Leanne Fisher and I'm in the Instructional Supports Department and today we are talking about Kindergarten Oral Language Block Plan, Do, and Review. So just something to think about. What is one way you increase student talk through child to adult interactions? And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We'll start to talk about that a little bit after we go over the Plan, Do, Review. So one thing to be thinking about here, not sure why my slides won't go. There we go. I hit record, so this is a recorded session, so you can hopefully are either watching it back on your own time or with your team, and hello to everyone who's watching it. So our professional development norms, just remember to be committed, responsible, respectful, and be safe, and we're so glad that you're here, or I am so glad that you're here. Um, for our professional development norms, we don't need to worry about this because you're watching this at your own time. And we're going to look at our professional development norms here with our CSD framework, our high quality academic and behavioral instruction and intervention, our data for decision making and our team based problem solving. Right now we're focusing on that evidence based instructional priorities. And we are looking at where we are with our best practices. We're also going to take a look at today our learning intentions and success criteria is learning intention. I am learning how to implement the oral language block for plan to review those specific pieces of that kindergarten oral language block. And I'll know I'm successful when I can plan for the oral language block with intentional planning, um, intentional due time, and an intentional uh, review time. So our agenda is what is the oral language block? Let's take a look at what planning time is, our due time, some call it work time. We have our review time with the students. We'll look at child to adult interactions and then engaging in student play. So going back to our kindergarten oral language block, the purpose of why we implement the oral language block is that oral language is that foundation and the development of where students get to that place of where they're comprehending and reading fluently. For those of you who've attended Letters Unit 5 recently, um, face to face with Lynn, we were talking a lot about vocabulary and about language and oral language specifically. And students um, in kindergarten specifically struggle if they don't have the language to be able to do something. If I say, please go over and get the pencil from the pencil sharpener container, um, they need to know what all of those pieces are. What's a pencil? What's a pencil sharpener container? Um, and what is the sharpener? Those are all language pieces that students need to have exposure to. And that's where we get to that piece of where they're not only hearing it, but they're being able to say it. So that's through talk. So thinking about how that oral language of this house is that foundation, and that's that strong foundation for our students. It's that secure base that we build upon with that phonological awareness. So being able to manipulate those sounds and play with the language that they hear to then taking it to that connection of the phonics. So we're taking the sound of something, the bigger piece of phonological awareness to phonemic awareness, and then taking it and connecting it to that alphabetic principle of phonics, and then being fluent with those pieces, right? That alphabetic principle all along the side, being able to have vocabulary, not just definitions of vocabulary, but being able to hear the word, say the word, talk about the word and connect that word to text. And then ultimately building onto that house of comprehension of being able to read to comprehend of what I'm doing. Um, we also go back to that receptive and expressive language. Receptive is what I'm hearing, expressive is what I'm saying. Students aren't um, can be expected to write about something if they haven't had the opportunity to hear about it, speak about it, read about it, and then write about it. This right here example is what you're doing in your foundations block and what you're also doing in your language comprehension block with your wonders curriculum. Students are listening to the text, they're talking about the text, they're reading about the text, and then they're responding to the text, but they can't be expected to respond to it if they haven't had the opportunity to do those other pieces of the language. We want our students to be talking and we want them to be talking with you as the teacher, that leader in the building, talking with their peers, that child to child interaction, and then that adult to child interaction, um, where it's very intentional with what you're doing. And this isn't something that's just specific to the oral language block, but this is across all your content and all of your day with your, your morning meeting, your, your literacy block, your math block, um, where you're embedding that science and social studies pieces. So when we're thinking about how do we roll out this oral language block, it's going back to looking at our climates. We have the laissez-faire, we have the supportive, and we have the directive. We're looking more at that supportive climate where you are parallel playing with your students during the oral language block. And when I say supportive, it means that you're, you're playing with your students, you're down on the floor, you're at the, the block area, you're at the house area, um, and you're being intentional. I know there's lots of things that you would like to be doing during this time, um, but this is what makes it oral language 
language block and not play time. So if you find yourself saying we're going to play time, I'm going to challenge you to start using the language of oral language block. And I think that will help you with the intention of what you're doing during that time. And also having our students understand that this is intentional play. Yes, it is play, but it's intentional to build that oral language through play. So really challenge yourself to see what do I call this for my students? And if somebody was to walk in my were to walk into my room right now and say, what are you doing? The goal is that your students would be saying, I'm at oral language block time, or I'm at the planning time, I'm at the due time or work time, or I'm at review time. So be thinking about that as just a little reflection for yourself. So planning time is when children plan in a small group. Um, they're letting them know what they're going to be doing during their work time. When we make a plan, we're more likely to follow through with it because we're a little bit more organized in our thoughts and our details. That's what we're trying to model here with the students when they're sharing their plan with their, with their peers or with their teacher, or maybe if there's a volunteer in your classroom or an interventionist or a para. How they can do this is verbally, but the idea is, is that we evolve into a place of where they're writing that plan and we can start to start embed some of those standards into that writing where we're looking at capitalization, spaces in between a punctuation, um, you know, periods at the end, but we're also looking at some of our um, foundations block that can be transferred into that plan. And we know that standards are saying that, yes, we can do a verbal and we can do a picture, but we don't want to stay there forever. We want students to get to a place of where they can actually be writing that plan and articulating that to you or to their peers. And that's when they're sharing their plan using those sentence pieces and those sentence frames to now get more language. It's not just about writing the plan, but let's talk about the plan where you could even have some sentence stems to help them with where they're going to be going. So our planning areas of where a student can go to, you should all have posters in your classroom. If you don't, please reach out to me at Leanne or Leanne Fisher at KenyansDistrict.org. I'm happy to send these posters to you, or if yours are getting a little bit worn out, I'm happy to send you some new ones. You have your, your block area, book area, house area, math area, writing, and then your art area. Um, please be mindful that these areas are really all up and running at the same time, and there can be a slow, um, gradual introduction to these, but the idea is, is that all of these areas are up to allow students to have choice, um, and then you can switch out what happens to be in those areas. Here's some examples of some of the planning journals and where will I go. It's allowing students to have that language and begin to have that language if they don't about what area they're going to go to and then having the scaffold. You can see a couple different opportunities for students where they're down at the right hand corner where they're getting to a place of drawing, but they're moving into that writing and talk about uh, an assessment that you can have from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, you know, where I moved from where they were drawing the pictures to where now they're writing those sentences. And I have that over time to be able to show a lot of implementation and application to my standards. Um, here's some more examples of how the posters are put up into the classroom with some sentence frames underneath. So if I have a population of students who don't have the language, I'm going to give them that language with that sentence frame underneath it. So I'm going to create. Um, let's talk about what that word means to create something. So talk about the vocabulary that you can be using. Um, it doesn't just have to be the everyday language. Let's put in some of our vocabulary from our text, some of that more academic language. So that planning time reflection, um, what makes planning time purposeful for your students currently right now? And what would you like to see your students doing, doing during planning time for this school year? So what can we do to make it a little bit more intentional for a plan? Let's see if I can move this up out of the way a little bit here. So during the due time and the work time, after they've made their plan, children move to their work areas and then they follow through with that plan. Um, children learn to carry out their intentions, engage with materials, peers, and solve problems. How can they do this? Is that, well, they, using your areas, students will go to and work with their intention. If they're telling you where they're going to plan, then you know where you can go and watch and inquire with them to see and observe their play before you approach it. It's okay if they change their mind in different areas. That's what we want them to do is to be able to have that choice. But you as the teacher can be intentional with, I noticed that you planned here. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing in this area here and what you plan to do. Here's some pictures of some due time. I'm looking for some new pictures. So whoever is watching this, please let me know if you would like um, some support. And I'd love to plan with you and see how we can get some more um, or some new pictures for our oral language block presentations. But here's some examples of what teachers are doing and engaging in the play to make it really intentional for our students. 
Here's some more for work time. We've got the math. We've got a little bit of an art area, making it more along the lines of the seasonal piece of being able to tie it in. We have the great opportunity of now having our wonders curriculum and our new tech sets to be able to put those into a lot of our areas to make it more applicable to extend that time, um, especially for our half day teachers where time is such a, a crucial piece. Um, and even in the full day as well, but that half day, your, your minutes literally are smaller. So this is a great opportunity to extend that into your oral language block. So review time, not every child has to review. Typically, you're looking at four or five students who are going to review, but we, we know in kindergarten, some students tend to be egocentric when we're five and six years old, so they all want to be able to share. So allow them an opportunity of where you've got a system down of who's going to present to all, but then you also give an opportunity to share with a partner or another adult in the room about what they did, and they recall what they did. They use the materials to bring up and show their peers what they made. Um, you know, give them the microphone, but also remind them, give them the sentence frames of what to talk. Children don't have a problem with talking, but it's that academic intentional piece we want them to be supported with. So if you're going to give them something like a microphone, um, make sure that you're really intentional with what it's going to, what they're going to say when they get that microphone. Um, and being able to share with everyone, which then allows, like I have here, increasing those opportunities to respond and then increasing that oral language. Moving to adult to child interactions, that's what I had talked about in the very beginning when we had talked about um, to, to reflect on when we first got started is what does it look like in your classroom right now for adult to child interaction. So this is where we want children to feel secure and successful when teachers interact positively with them both verbally and non verbally. So sometimes the interaction doesn't always have to be right off the bat where you're just jumping in and talking and asking all these questions. But it's being able to see what your students are doing um, and you know your students very well, you know what they're what they like and what um, what most likely motivates them. So it's that verbal listening, um, conversing and having that calm voice when you're approaching their play. Again, this is where you are being a part of this plan. This is just like you in your literacy block, just like you in your math block. This is you being intentional with those students um, and, and having fun with them during this time. It's non-verbally smiling, nodding, making eye contact, getting down to the student's eye level, if that's what they culturally are acceptable for them, that you're making that eye contact. Um, and letting them know that when you're talking, this is one way that we can approach and have a conversation which goes back and forth, not just you always talking at the student, but talking with your students and modeling what that talking can look like back and forth. So it's acknowledging their activities and accomplishments, not assuming what they're doing, but inquiring about what they're doing. And it's you're valuing the student's work and interest and encouragement. You truly are engaging in what they're doing and you truly value what they're saying to you. And you wanna hear more. You're posing questions to seek to understand. So how do we get children to talk? Again, typically a five and a six year old doesn't have a problem with talking, but it's that intentional talk that we're trying to get here with, which is increasing the vocabulary and the opportunities for them to be talking and having conversations back and forth, right? Not just those close ended conversations. So it's having that close proximity. You know, it's not being back at your desk and yelling across the hall or across the room when the student's at the block area. It's being intentional to get up and, and know that you're interested in what that student is doing and what they're creating. You're looking at their faces. It's not multitasking on your computer, um, grading papers, progress monitoring. It's really being intentional with what they're doing. Um, and it's showing that you're listening because not only are you showing them that you're listening, you're modeling that behavior as well because you want them to do the same thing for you, right? It's that back and forth piece. Um, for child to adult. Again, going back to avoid multitasking, this is not an opportunity for you to be doing something back at your desk. Um, it's for you to be engaging. So think about right now, just take a moment to reflect on what do you do when the students are intentionally playing during the oral language block? Um, talk about what they want to talk about and care and inquire. This is an opportunity for where we had talked about if you were in unit five for letters recently face to face again, just having that little bit of a, that two minute conversation with the student, what that can do for building that relationship and trust. Um, uh, talk about what they talk about, talk about what they are doing, and then using new words. If you know as the teacher that when you're intentionally planning this, that you have those um, vocabulary words from your wonders, that you're using those words. If you have your high frequency words, that you're using those. Um, and you're looking at the new words and you're repeating them often, not to a point of where it doesn't make sense, but to a point where it can really be applied and students can hear that language. And maybe it becomes a piece of, for every time you hear that word, I'm gonna put a tally on the board there when I hear it used correctly. 
so that we can start to increase that um, application of that language, not just memorizing it or looking at the definition, but connecting it to text or to their real play. So children will talk more if we avoid interrupting them. Just stop and think about in a child's life how many times they might be interrupted, but not knowing that we're interrupting them because they haven't finished their thought, because they're still processing their thought given their brain development, whereas an adult might already know. So be thinking about, are we giving students that wait time to be able to say what they want? And have we shut down the conversation because I wanted to say what I wanted to say more? Avoid changing topics quickly. Don't change, don't bounce and go back and forth to certain things. Really stay tuned to what you're doing um, and allow them in their brain that time to process. Um, make sure that we're approaching it and that we're patient. We're modeling that behavior. If we come in uncalm, Kids feed off of that energy. So what energy are you bringing to the table or literally to the rug when you're coming down to play? Ensure each time that a child's um, needs are organized into words and sentences. So um, when they're talking, go back. It's okay to go ahead and not call them out on the incorrectness, but you're modeling that correct sentence frame for them and letting them know that when they're organizing their thoughts and ideas that you're repeating it in that correct sentence. Um, so if they say something like um, house area, Oh, I understand. You want to go play in the house area? Let's say that together. I want to go to the blank area. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So that's where you're giving those prompts and you're gesturing to pointing to what area you want to go to. Um, or you're even looking at something like that beginning sound. And then you have those anchor charts around the room for the areas that you're going to. So those are also your anchors and your gestures that you can point to for your students to feel set up for success. And then it's acknowledging and praising their efforts. So just we can't have enough acknowledgement and praise for a five and a six year old, right? There's so many um, missed opportunities because sometimes we feel like we're being so corrective that we forget that that positive corrective is going to get us a lot more than that, um, cor uh, that corrective feedback. Nothing wrong with corrective feedback, right? That's how we're learning. If there's something that they're doing incorrectly, we need to be able to give them that, that corrective feedback, but then be mindful of that positive opportunity to really lift that st student up to, to be positive, right? That's what we want to be is we want to model those pieces for them. That's our job as adults. So approaching a child's play, there's two ways that we can look at this. And um, one of them is called the four L's. So it's where you're looking, you're listening, you're leaning, and you're lowering your voice. This is something that I have heard in, in K-12. Um, but when we look about those four L's, it's really teaching children how to have a conversation back and forth with a peer or with an adult, um, because we just assume that children know how to talk to somebody, right? Um, but why not be explicit with everything else that we do? We're explicit, so why not have this opportunity? So it's the four L's. It's looking, it's listening, you're leaning into your student to hear what they're having to say, and then you're lowering your voice. Um, so also the other one is soul. That's where you're silently observing to understand and listen to what your students are doing. So after students have gone to their playtime um, and they're going to their area and they're intentionally doing what the plan they followed out with, you as the teacher might be just standing back for a moment and you're having that acronym of soul. I'm silently understanding what my students are doing and then I'm gonna listen to what their play is before I approach it. Um, I never want to hijack a child's play without really understanding what they're doing. And let's be intentional about who we're going to go over and play with. Um, why would I choose this student over this student? And um, maybe I know that this student hasn't really been talking a lot today. Um, how do they communicate with me then? So let's go over and start to see what motivates them during their playtime. So then I can use that as a way to greet them in the morning and say, hey, I noticed that you played in the, with the blocks yesterday. Tell me a little bit about what you were building and what your plan was. So it's a way to extend into that building of the relationship. So there's different types of talk for your students that you can be modeling. One of those is the parallel talk. Um, it's where teachers describe what the child is doing. So you're literally just repeating what they're doing. So if a child is making a tall tower, I might say something like, you're making a really tall tower. That is almost as tall as you um, as a student is working in the block area. And I'm just modeling. I'm not asking questions. I'm just seeking to understand, but also letting them know in a kind way that I'm listening and watching what they're doing. And I'm acknowledging that play. And then think about all the language that they're hearing through me modeling that correct academic language. Another type of talk is self-talk, and that's literally where the teacher is talking about what she or he is going to be doing. So if I were playing with the students and I'm in this the house area, I might be saying to myself, 
I'm going to put the cookie on the plate and pour hot chocolate in the mug. And I'm playing and modeling this while the children are around me. And I'm going to say, oh, let's take a look at this recipe. It says here that I need this, a half a cup of milk. Okay, I need a half a cup of milk. And then maybe throw it out there and pose a question. Does anyone want to help me with that half a cup of milk? Hmm. So now I'm starting to bring in some of that language, but I'm also asking them to participate in the play with me. So self-talk, super fun to do. Sometimes children engage in it and sometimes they don't. Sometimes it feels really uncomfortable and that's okay. The more you practice it as the adult in the classroom, the easier it gets. So again, I truly encourage you to be a part of this play to make this oral language block successful for your students. The other piece of type of talk is expansion. So this is where you're adding on to more of what the child expresses. So if a student says paper, um, maybe they want paper for the art area or the writing area, and you're saying, yes, that is green paper that you can create a tree with. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to see what you're gonna be doing with that. Is there any other paper that you would need? Um, but you're expanding on the language. So, and you're also putting it into a complete thought for them to understand, and then maybe even asking them to repeat it back as well. So just some things to think about when you're approaching play, um, when you don't know what to say or do, those are some ways to support you. We also have the adult to child interactions. Again, going back to that, this is an opportunity for you to be intentional with their play. You're looking at those closed ended questions. Um, that's gonna close the conversation. What are you doing right now? Um, can I play with you? They can simply say yes and no. And if they say no, then the conversation is over. So when we look at more of an open-ended question to the conversation, we put into some of those questions of, I wonder, or tell me more, or I noticed that. Um, and I'll show you a poster here at the end of what that can look like. So in general, teachers use more closed-ended questions than open-ended questions, because in teaching, we're looking for the right answer. We're checking for um, understanding and mastery. But for here, this is where we get the opportunity to have those open-ended conversations um, to engage in our, in our students' play. So again, here's some of those open-ended questions and requests. How did you tell me about? What happened when? Um, what did you think when? What will you do? Explain how or tell me more. So just something to think about for you as the teacher when you're watching this. Here's a picture of a child um, working at the table. This looks like they were at the math area. How would you approach this student's, or sorry, this is the planning time. How would you approach this student's planning time? What would it look like for you as the teacher to go around and start to build that language already during the planning time? Because planning time can be quiet. So what can we do to start making it where we're increasing that language? Another question I pose to you is the student is doing uh, the due time. They're by themselves, which means if they're by themselves, it doesn't really mean that they're hearing any language or they're getting to express any language. So how would you approach the student's um, due time or work time? Remember, we're not calling it the play time. We're calling it either the due time or the work time. So how would you approach the student? Going back to our four L's, we have our soul, and then we have our ways to expand, parallel talk um, or parrot talk. So something to think about, think about a student that you might have in your classroom where you notice that they're playing um, independently often and how can we change that to make it more intentional. This is the observe and comment poster that I was telling you about. This is also something that you should have in your kindergarten classroom. And if you don't, please let me know and I'm happy to send you one. This is more for you than it is the students. This is an anchor for you as the teacher when you're when you're engaging in the student's play, you have this up on the wall. Um, and when you don't know how to approach their play, these are the things that you can observe and comment on. And that's where you can say anything about what they're doing in the block area, the writing area, all six of your areas to be really intentional about what they're doing in their play. And I'll be honest, when you're the teacher and they see you in an area, um, don't be surprised if a few students follow you because they want to be where you're at. And that's a really good thing that says a lot about you because they want to be by you. So use that opportunity to really build those relationships and, and have a good time with your students. So some suggestions, remember to rely on your comments, not your questions, but your comments that you're saying to your students, rely on your questions responsibly. You also have your soul, which is your silently understand to listen silently observe to understand and listen to what the student's play is. You have your four L's of your look, lean, listen, and lower. It's okay to leave it open-ended. It might feel more awkward to you as the adult, but it doesn't feel awkward to the, to the student. Um, so allow yourself that grace to, to practice and get really good at approaching a child's play. 
Um, there's the talk types, right? We have our parallel, we have our um, parrot, and we have our expansion of our language. And then just be genuine, have fun with your students. This is an opportunity for you to engage in their play. I can't stress that enough. And I'm also going to remember, I'm going to challenge you that thinking about what are your actions during the oral language block? Can you be more intentional? Can you be more planful and purposeful? Um, I didn't put the slides in here because the last oral language block bite size PD that I did in the spring has the pages for you. I didn't want to repeat the same uh, presentation, but remember there are the pages in the instructional guide that give you a scope and sequence aligned to um, your literacy and your math curriculum, as well as your science and social studies standards that are identified. And then there's also a planning template where you can have a template that's planned for your oral language block, and then you have a blank template where you can start to fill out your own materials that you want to have in those areas. Um, so just something to think about, too, that you have those planning pieces to support you. Um, the other piece, too, is before I say goodbye, is remember when you're thinking about your materials, materials can and come in all different shapes and sizes. You have your grade level budget to purchase things for um, specific areas, but also your, your colleagues in your other grades are also a wealth of resources. If you need something, I've heard teachers have put an email out, and the next morning they come with a plethora of things in the faculty room for those kindergarten teachers. So let's say I need five boxes of cereal that are empty because I want to put those boxes of cereal in my house area. Five boxes of cereal shows up, they're empty. You just want the boxes to show students that real print, right? The real uh, realia of play in a kitchen. Um, I've had teachers who brought in irons and cut off the cords, phones cut off the cords. Cell phones are a huge thing for students to play um, and be able to walk around the room and talk with their peers with. Uh, talk about increasing the play right there on a conversation. So. I'm happy to help with ideas of how you can increase those materials in your classroom so you don't feel like you have to purchase things. That's not what the idea is. Um, and you'll be surprised what your students can create with just the simple things that you put out. So please reach out if you have any questions. Again, I'm Leanne Kusher, and I'm happy to help with whatever you need. Um, and good luck. I challenge you to do um, take away the playtime and call it oral language block. And I challenge you to, to get in there and start playing. Thanks so much.